That is true. I was, I watched our uh, older kids working with the younger kids, and they were they were struggling mightily themselves. So, um, I was at Camp Onaway this weekend, and I knew I've known for a couple of weeks I was going to be up there a few weeks. This is a regular weekend called Father Son Weekend. Uh, it's not just a bunch of older leaders with little young kids that aren't their own. It's dads with their young children. Uh, and this year, as I said, this is the youngest father-son weekend I have ever seen. Uh, Nicholas was with us at five, and he was not the youngest by far. Um, so we did a lot of cat herding this weekend. Um, and of course, being up in Onaway and, and up there for father-son weekend, when I started thinking about a message for today, I said, well, obviously I got to talk about fathers and sons. And I had some different ideas and some different thoughts, and then uh, I came across something that I thought was really fitting. So today, I'm going to be reading, and I'm going to start by reading the entire uh, key verse. Uh, it comes from Luke chapter 15. As you hear it, you will know the story. It is, again, as I tend to say a lot, something we've heard before. Hopefully, by the time we're done, I will be able to present it in a little different way. So in Luke 15, starting in verse 1, uh, it's on page 105 if you're using the Gold Pew Bibles, page 105. One day, when many tax collectors and other outcasts came to listen to Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling. This man welcomes outcasts and even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. What does he do? He leaves the other 99 sheep in the pasture and goes looking for the one that got lost until he finds it. When he finds it, he is so happy that he puts it on his shoulders and carries it back home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says to them, I am so happy I found my lost sheep. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins loses one of them. What does she do? She lights a lamp, sweeps her house, and looks carefully everywhere until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says to them, I am so happy I found the coin I lost. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. Jesus went on to say, There was once a young man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the property now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in reckless living. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. At last he came to his senses and said, All my father's hired workers have more than they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you, against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity, and he ran, threw his arms around his son, and kissed him. Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called to his servants. Hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it, and let us celebrate with a feast. 
for this son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. In the meantime, the older son was out in the field. On his way back, when he came close to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come back home, the servant answered, and your father has killed the prize calf because he got him back safe and sound. The older brother was so angry that he would not go into the house, so his father came out and begged him to come in. But he spoke back to his father, Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave, and I have never disobeyed your orders. What have you given me? Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. But this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes, and when he comes back home, you kill the prized calf for him? My son, the father answered, you are always here with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be happy, because your brother was dead, and now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. As I said, it's a story we're all familiar with, right? The lost sheep, the lost coin. Mike is dead. So I'll stand here and preach today. The, the stories are ones that we're familiar with. They're stories that we learn as we're kids and we hear again as we get older and we hear uh, sort of a lot. But there was an approach that I saw and I heard and I wanted to visit it. Because when we read this, we tend to focus on the lost sheep. We tend to focus on the lost coin. We tend to focus on the lost son. I want to focus on the other son. I want to talk about the son who stayed. I want to talk about the son who worked for his father and did what his father told him and did all these things and then had to watch as this other son came home. I think we can relate to him. I think as people we can understand how it might feel to watch this guy get all of his property, sell it, waste it, and then come back and be given more. There's a part of us that would say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. Look at all the stuff I do. Look at everything I've done. And now he's going to benefit from it. I did the story, or the, the one of these things is not like the other with the kids because it applies here. This told three stories. One of them involved a lost sheep. The sheep had no idea what it was doing. The sheep is innocent in being lost. It simply wandered away. And the shepherd who is responsible for that sheep said, my sheep is lost, I need to go find it. And he goes out, he finds it, he brings it back, and he celebrates the finding of that lost sheep. Likewise, you have this lost coin. And they talk about that, tens, that silver coin. That's a very significant amount of money that this woman had lost. And she knows that it's lost, and she does everything she can to find it. Again, the coin, it's an inanimate object. It doesn't realize that it's lost. It didn't do anything to become lost. It simply was. And still, this woman does everything she can, and when she finds it, she celebrates the fact that she had found it. Now you turn to the prodigal son. The first difference in the prodigal son is that the son knew what he was doing. He, of his own actions, became lost. The father didn't cast him out. The father didn't leave him somewhere accidentally. The father didn't, you know, chuck him aside and go, where'd my son go? No, the son actively went out and did things that we could consider both disobedient to the father and perhaps unwise wasting the money and spending it all. 
But there's another difference, and that goes to the son that we don't often think about, this other son. Because the other son doesn't act the way that the shepherd in the story of the lost sheep acted. He doesn't act the way that the woman who lost the coin does. A very different sort of individual. In fact, when the when the son comes home, the father is overjoyed. The dad is horribly excited that his son has returned. He's so excited that he throws a feast. The brother wasn't. He was mad. He was angered. Um, and in a way that I think we could consider sinful. He wasn't thinking about his brother. He was thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about the great celebration of his, son, his brother returning home, he was thinking about what he lost, perhaps, by the son coming home. And where we can think a little bit differently is, imagine if the brother, in this case, had been like the shepherd in the parable of the lost sheep. Imagine if the brother had been like the woman who lost the silver coin. What if the brother had said, my brother is lost. My brother has left the home, has not returned. We don't know what's happened to him. I have to go find him. What if the brother had said, done wrong, but I don't want to be angry at him. I don't want to be mad at him. I am saddened by his loss, and I'm going to do everything in my power to bring him home. If the, sec if the other son had done that, if the other son had reflected the grace and forgiveness that the father showed the son, who might the other son look a lot more like? Can we think of another son who went out and said, I have to go find the lost. I have to show grace and forgiveness for the lost. I, you've, you all probably have a name on your lips. Hopefully you do. Because the name would be Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the son of a father with lots of lost children. Jesus didn't come here and say, what's lost to me? What do I lose if I protect those who are lost? What do I gain? You know, you think about it. Jesus, he lost his life. He gained a kingdom, but he lost his life. It was a sacrifice he had to make, and he did it because he thought of it the way that the shepherd the widow who lost the money, and the father of the prodigal son looked at the lost. Imagine what we would be looking at if Jesus had not taken that approach. If instead Jesus had looked at us like the prodigal son's brother did. What if Jesus had said, what are you doing? Why are you showing them this grace? Why are you being like that? Why are you forgiving them for all the sin they've done? We would, in a word, be doomed because none of us can offer enough sacrifices to make up for the sin in our lives. As I looked at that, I thought we need to tie that back to the mission of the church, both this church and the greater church, right? Because what is it that Jesus called upon in the Great Commission. And that comes in Matthew 28, at the very end in verses 19 and 20. It's one again, the Great Commission we're fairly familiar with, but I'll read it. It says, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with you always to the end of the age. We are disciples who treasure Christ and seek to make disciples for Christ. 
when we do that, we need to take the mentality and the, take the approach of Jesus as, as opposed to that of the prodigal son's brother. We need to think about what Jesus would have us do as opposed to what we have to gain or what we have to lose through our actions. We're called to reach out and to go out and look for the lost. We're not called to sit and wait for the lost to come home. We need to think about the shepherd who went out and looked for the sheep. We need to think about the woman who went out and lost for the coin, or looked for the coin. And most importantly, we need to think about Jesus versus the prodigal son's brother and how we can reflect what Jesus would have us do in our lives. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who speak to me, those who I hear, who provide new ways of looking at things. It's easy to read the Bible and to miss a message or to hear it and see it a different way. And it's good to have people that uh, touch our lives and give us messages or provide us ways of looking at things that maybe wouldn't have come to us and that help us to better serve what you would have us doing. I ask that you be with all the members of this congregation, myself included, as we move from worship into CEF. Help us again to have open hearts and open minds and to hear what you're telling us through the words of our teachers. We know that as teachers, all we can do is try to share the message that you would have us give. So be with the teachers as well and help them to have the spirit and the wisdom that you would have them need in order to provide the teaching that those in this church need. Be with us now as we go about the rest of our day. In your name we pray, amen.